I want to welcome you to, um, this is an event that is co-sponsored by the Francis Schaeffer Society and the CFC. Um, I want to say it's a great delight to be back on campus and to see some friendly faces and to kind of say hi and catch up a little bit. It's a great delight for me. In, 19, in 1973, as you remember, the Supreme Court laid down the decision, the famous or infamous Roe versus Wade, um, which gave legal abortion, gave abortion legal status here in the United States. And I think, unfortunately, at that time, few evangelicals grasp the moral uh, magnitude of this ruling and what it would mean for future discussions on the status of a human being at both ends of the cycle and now in between. But eventually, it would become even more critical as it would redefine what it means to be a person. Six years after the um, Roe-Aid um, decision, in 1979, Alarmed by the, na the naivete of evangelicals, particularly in the United States, Francis Schaeffer, with Everett Koop, published a book which was entitled, Whatever Happened to the Human Race? And there was an accompanying film series by the same title. And the subtitle, which we often don't read, but it is exposing our rapid yet subtle loss of human rights and it's now not so subtle anymore. It becomes obvious as we've made our way further down uh, the road. Now, some, 36, uh, th some 38 years later, we are witnessing an alarming proposals, I think, for humanity as the definition of a human person has been reinvented to fit the naturalistic vision of reality. Francis Schaeffer started his book the, in the opening pages of uh, Whatever Happened to the Human Race. He wrote this, Cultures can be judged in many ways, but eventually every nation in every age must be judged by this test. How did we treat people? Each generation, each wave of humanity evaluates its processes on this basis. The final measure of mankind's humanity is how humanely people treat one another. I think that he would never have guessed that things would have gone, in a sense, from bad to worse, not just procedurally, but because we have started to redefine what it means to be a human person. And once that's done, we were speaking at dinner tonight, the power of naming what you name something will indicate what you can do to it. So if you call it a bug, you can stamp on it and squish it without any moral or legal ramifications. The power of naming. And we are renaming the human person, which has given us options that we would never have thought. Well, if Schaefer is right, and the moral trajectory continues on its present course, I think history will judge us severely. Now you, uh, tonight, um, we are going to, the, the title is a little ambiguous, vague, maybe it is humanity in crisis, because at the bottom of all of this is what is happening to the human person. And it's far away from what evangelicals or what the Bible teaches us. Now you might wonder, the first, our first uh, speaker will be Dr. Liedbach, and he's going to set sort of the broad, the broad theological, uh, uh, ethical framework for understanding what is a human being as one who's made in the image of God. The next will be um, <laughs> Andrew Taylor. Walker? I'm sorry. I know somebody else that name. And he will speak on transgenderism. And then Dr. Mitchell is going to speak on 
gene editing. Now you say, well, what do those all have in common? They have this in common. These are shaping how we think about how we treat and how we engage the human person. And we want to get the discussion at that level. I'm hoping that this would somehow help us to have a meaningful discussion in the future. Uh, I had, as I said, the, it's humanity in crisis. My thought was when I did that, that we would have a number of events like this, and each event would take up some area of ethical, moral eth areas that where humanity is being challenged in, particularly in America. But it is also, of course, true in Europe as well. Uh, whether or not that ever comes to pass, I don't know. This must be the, this may be the grand uh, hurrah, the last finale. Anyway, so what's going to, the drill for tonight is this. We'll have Dr. Lederbach. Then we'll have uh, Andrew Walker. And then we'll have Ben Mitchell. They'll speak for about 25, 30 minutes. And as soon as they finish, then I'll introduce the next speaker. After the three have spoken, then we'll take a 15-minute break. Then you come back at a time for Q&A. So I realize you say, oh my, may I forget my question. Jot the question down if you have questions. And they will, sir, they will be here as a panel. This is a great opportunity to ask some folks who have thought deeply about these matters, far deeper than we have. And if we want to have any, say anything meaningful to our culture as a lodge, you've got to be well informed before you're going to say anything meaningful. So I hope that tonight we'll be able to do that. Uh, so Dr. Lederbach leads really no introduction to this group, I suspect. Uh, he's a current uh, philosopher, a professor of theology. I almost call him a philosopher, and heaven bid I should do that. Um, a current <laughs> professor of theology, ethics, and culture, vice president of student life, dean of students. He is authored. Um, his last book was Chasing Infinity, I believe, and he's working on something else, but we can't say what it is because you'll probably never get it finished. <laughs> and we don't want we don't want you to be feel badly about it. So I would like for you to welcome Dr. Liedebach. Okay, let me uh, first of all say thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. And um, because of the nature of the event, uh, my job is primarily to warm you up to the discussion and set the platform for the two gentlemen that will follow me. Uh, when you think about what Andrew Walker and Ben Mitchell are currently doing and some of the reputation of them in the field, I feel kind of like a Cessna airplane with two 747s about to land around me. So uh, it's, this is a really sweet opportunity to, to be here and to be here with these particular gentlemen. So um, let, me, let me warm you up to this discussion by telling you about a recent conversation that I had with a fourth year uh, doctoral student in the field of medicine. Um, his, was, his field is veterinary medicine, but he's, he's engulfed in the questions of life and care and, and uh, at, a, at the level of a fourth year doctoral student, um, far more advanced than his understanding of biology. Um, and so as we got into the conversation, the question came up because a friend of this young man, another married couple, uh, had just recently adopted a frozen embryo. And the question was on the table as we were having a conversation was whether or not adopting a frozen human embryo has the same moral quality as adopting a child who's already been born. And he was having a trouble trying to decipher between the difference one to another. And as we got into the conversation, um, here's one of the young, uh, one of the brightest, most talented men I know. And if he didn't have the categories to how to think through this, even though he was a fourth year medical student. Now, why is that the case? Well, I think one, one of the reasons that's the case is because all of us are developing in our theology and our understanding of ethics and philosophy as we go through life. And so there, we don't fault him for that. There's no lack of intelligence that's involved there. But I do think that there's an increasing indication that even in our medical fields, the assumptions about what it means to be human and how we decipher the value of human nature is, is grounded on worldview assumptions that don't necessarily have anything in common with Christianity anymore. 
right? So here you have a Christian brother who's in his fourth year of med school asking some of these questions. So I thought I might introduce you to that conversation and to uh, basically let you enter into it as well. Okay, so while this discussion that I had with this particular gentleman was about whether or not it's okay to freeze a human being in the first place and then thaw that human being and then have that human being placed into a, a human body and then brought to live birth, whether that's the same thing as adopting a child who's already been born, part of the conversation is how would you know how to decipher the value of that? Right? So let me introduce you to the conversation by, by suggesting it this way. Let me show you a few pictures of the human being and you help me think through how you know when one of these pictures is more valuable than another one of these pictures. Okay? So here's how fertilization takes place. And then you have a baby at two weeks old. And then you have a baby at six weeks old. And then you have a baby at four months old. You have a baby at six months. You have a baby just prior to birth. How do you make the distinction between the first one and a full-grown adult. In case you don't know, that's Francis Schaeffer. Since we're at the Schaeffer Society, I thought I might <laughs> put a picture of Dr. Schaeffer up here on there. So which one's more valuable? Now, as your mind is processing through that question, what you need to be aware of is the way that you're processing th through that question is telling you everything about your worldview. There's an underlying assumption, an underlying set of values. There's an underlying principles and ideas about what it means to be a human being that is shaping the way that you're making that evaluation take place. And I think what we're finding in our culture is because of the theological anthropology question, in other words, how do you know what a human being is and when a human being is actually a human person, that question becomes foundational to really everything that goes on with ethics. What we're going to discuss tonight is not only how that relates to something like early beginning of life questions, but what about end of life and things in between related to sexuality and et cetera. So as we do that then, let me, my job again is to kind of set the table. So as you think through this question, which one's more valuable, let me tell you what's actually happening in your, in your, in your framework of thinking so that at least you have that, those categories in mind so when our next two speakers come up, you'll be understanding where they're going with some of those ideas. So when we talk about the field of ethics, there's typically three ways that people will engage the discipline or the discussion of ethics. And those are what we would describe as meta-ethics, normative ethics, and then applied ethics. So let me take a moment just to identify what each one of those three mean for us on that. When we speak about meta-ethics, largely what we're doing in that contest is speaking about worldview ideas, the fundamental assumptions that you have about the world and the way that it exists and how God has placed it together or whether God even exists at all. So typically when we talk about meta-ethics or worldviews, and you'll see here I'm actually bringing those together almost as synonyms, Typically when we do so, we're engaging this question in relation to these five categories. Now when we do so, we mean by metaphysics, what is the nature of reality? When we talk about epistemology, we're thinking about how do I know certain things? When we talk about hum uh, anthropology, we're asking the question is what is the nature of a human being? Is a human being only the cells and the matter that we have or is there also a soul? When you talk about theology, it's similar to metaphysics in that where metaphysics might ask if God exists, if you answer yes to that, theology will then have the, what kind of God exists? What is that God like? And then, of course, that all will bleed into the way that we think about ethics or our moral philosophy. So what is crucial for us as we think through this category is that everybody has a worldview. The problem is that not everybody knows what theirs is. And because of that, what will happen is these underlying philosophical and theological um, uh, underpinnings and ideas will begin to bleed forward into the second category, which we would describe as normative ethics. Now, what normative ethics is, is this is how you move from the whys about the world, W-H-Y, the whys of the world, into the what's. And this is where you're, you're developing normative patterns. So the first four letters of that term, norms of behavior or principles, these would then be the, how you decide right and wrong. What, what is a command or a principle or why should I think about the world in that particular way? So this would have to do with more of the what's, what are the rules? So then when you have those in place, they come from underpinning ideas. You then have an idea about whether or not something is right or wrong or good or evil. Then you have to make the question of how do I apply it to a particular issue? 
Okay. Now for us, what I want to, let me give you for examples here to help you kind of put those three together. On the meta-ethical level, I might think about the question of what is gender. Okay, on the normative level, I might ask the question, is it okay for a man to marry a man? And then on an applied level, I might ask the question, should I go to a so-called gay wedding? Because so as you're thinking through that, you can see how underlying assumptions might then lead to whether I have a sense of something being right or wrong, and then a particular application of what does it mean for me in a particular setting. Similarly, you might ask the question at the meta-ethical level, what is a human person? Then is it okay to take a life? Is there something called sanctity of life at the normative level? And then is it okay to experiment on human embryos would be an application kind of question. So as we think through these threes, one of the ways you may be able to map this is to think about it in terms of this moving in a downward way, that you're always moving from a meta-ethical assumption. The problem is many people don't spend any time asking these questions in any serious way. So oftentimes what happens when you take an ethics class or you come to a meeting like this, you're thinking, okay, there's a rule. Let's say Exodus 20, 13, the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder. Well, if you start there, that's not a bad place to start, but it may be important to really ask questions in a culture like we're in now. Does a God even exist that makes this command have a certain kind of power? Or is this just something that's left over and it's just a rule like any other rule? Well, once you move down in this direction, then that would then drive the way I think about applied ethics. Now, many people will ultimately start here because they'll start with, but what about this situation? What about my two friends who are gay and they wanna get married? Or what about this couple that can't have kids? Well, the way you answer this question is that you need to start here, but most people don't want to do that. And we're in a culture now that's driven largely by personal desire. So key for us tonight, a key takeaway point from this here is that whenever a person makes an ethical application, they're always doing so from some worldview. The question is, what is that worldview? Okay. So as we think that through then, one of the things that we're always wanting to do is try to figure out how to be clear with what our worldview is and also be consistent in the way that we function from that point of view. So that's what our first talk is trying to get us to be thinking through down that. Okay, in order to do this then very quickly, way too quickly for the time that we have, um, some of you have been in some of our ethics classes so you're gonna get these faster than others, but really we're gonna try to address just in a real quick manner these three questions. What does it mean to be human? Why is it important to keep this notion of humanness central when we face ethical issues? And then I'll just briefly touch on what does it mean to flourish as a human being? Okay, so I'll spend the most of the time on the first one and move down and make particular application on two and then quickly touch on three as we finish. Okay, so let's, let's think about this from scripture. And these are the five scriptures that I would want to start at the conversation with. Of course, if we had more time, we could develop this in a much more robust manner. When we think about what it means to be a human, I think it's important for us to start with an understanding of God and who God is. And the fact of the matter is, is that the universe is theocentric in nature, not anthropocentric in nature. Meaning that the question doesn't primarily start with me. The, pressure, the question starts with who God is. And then I answer the question about humanness in light of the fact that God exists and he's the one that has created the world. Romans 11.36 will tell us that all things are created. Uh, they've been created from him and through him and to him. Colossians 1.16 will likewise say all things have been created through him and ultimately for him. And in the beginning, as Genesis 1.1 will tell us, in the beginning, it's God who creates the heavens and the earth. So as we think through this, then because there's a theocentric nature to the universe, then there's a couple applications that immediately begin to arise as we think about what it means to be human. First of all, human beings are not autonomous. And we're not just beings that have no grounding to us. No, in fact, we are uh, contingent beings on the fact that God, who's a non-contingent being, creates us. And so because of that reason, we understand that our contingency is both ontological, meaning that we have our being because someone gave it to us, but we're also contingent morally, meaning that the way that we will most flourish as human beings is if we live according to the way the one who created us designed us. Okay, so we're, we're not autonomous individuals. Secondly, and what follows from that also is that God then therefore knows best. And so what God reveals to us is oftentimes what we best, under, well not oftentimes, it's always going to be that which will help us flourish most. 
Now, one of the ways we describe that is that when we learn from the scriptures things about how we ought to live, what we're saying here is that because God's revealed to us reality, the scriptures, this book will tell us the nature of reality, it also then, because it tells us the nature of reality, it also tells us the nature of revealed morality. So the Bible functions in two really important ways ethically, by telling us the way things are and therefore telling us the way things ought to be. So the scriptures then become for us both revealed reality and revealed morality. And from this then we can learn not only our, our personal cause, why God created us in the first place, but the final things that he created us for and our design and how we could best flourish in light of that. So the key idea, understanding how we are made and then how to live according to what we're made like really becomes our moral compass. And that's really important for us. So Genesis 1.1 is not just the beginning of the Bible, it's actually the beginning of the way that you see your world. Okay, it's really an important piece. Now, second scripture we'll talk about, Genesis 1.27, and if you have your Bibles, I'm going to read it for us here. Um, this verse says, And God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female he created them. So three quick ideas from that. One of the things that we learn is that the essential nature the thing that sets human beings apart from any other kind of being is the fact that they bear the image of God, that they are the imago dei. Now, through history, there's been a lot of debate and discussion about what is the nature of what it means to be an image bearer. Crucial for us tonight to avoid some of those larger debates, and we can maybe, through Q&A, if you're interested in that, re-engage that. But here for us tonight, the fact that we are imago dei is the key piece of this. This is what sets human beings apart from all of the rest of creation, all of the rest of the beings on the planet, that we have the Imago Dei, we are the Imago Dei, and therefore we are, by definition, human persons because we have God's image in us. Secondly, as human beings, what you see here in Genesis 127 is that God creates us in his image, and he creates us with two enduring qualities. But not everybody has both. In fact, we only have one of those. There's male and there's female, and these are connected to the Imago Dei, the essential nature of what we are, but they are enduring qualities of what it means to be an, endure, uh, an image bearer. So Dr. Walker will get into this later tonight and develop the implications of that, but here we see essentially we're in the Imago Dei, and we bear the image as male, and we bear the image as female in an enduring fashion. Now, because of these things, we would then say human dignity or our value as humans comes because God has given us that value, not because of something we've done to earn it. And that's really an important piece of this whole discussion as we move forward and go into this uh, further. Let me then drive your attention toward Genesis 2.7. So as we think through then, we have these human beings created in a theocentric nature, or a universe, who bear the image of God as male or female, and therefore have a human dignity. Now we're asking the question, how did God design us? What's the unique design of human beings? Now what Genesis 2, 7 tells us, and again I'll read it for us, it says, The Lord God formed the man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living human being. So how we understand the human design is that a human being therefore has a physical part of themselves, the dust of the earth that God forms, and we also have an immaterial part to ourselves that we frequently refer to as the soul, and God integrates these two together. Now, if you've been in my ethics classes, you know I make a big deal of this visual that I'm doing right here. God didn't take the immaterial part of the soul and capture it in a body, meaning that if you kill the body, you free the soul. No, God integrated these together. And so for this idea, we have the language and ethics of embodied selves, or perhaps even more, uh, more accurately, we're psychosomatic wholes. And as body and soul together, what you do to the soul will affect your body, and what you do to your body does affect your soul. These things interplay in a very important manner. And Dr. Mitchell, I'm sure, will kind of begin to key on similar themes as he goes through his talk tonight. So keep that idea in mind that we are embodied selves or psychosomatic wholes that are in place there. Okay. Then, if you move to the language of Genesis 1.28 and understanding of humans, you begin to see that God has not only uh, given us a particular design, but he's given us a particular function. And here's where we get into a lot of the discussions of what can happen in the field of medicine. When the Lord tells us that we are supposed to subdue and rule the earth, he gives us what we oftentimes understand as the dominion mandate or the cultural mandate. And here, how we need to understand this within Genesis chapter 1 is that this is not unlimited. 
As God was giving this command to the man and the female together to rule the earth and to subdue it, he did so under the assumption that they're his image bearers and would do it like he would do it. And so this then, even though the word kibosh has a very muscular tone to it, it actually means to, to take into shape using force, and the idea of rule does mean having dominion, it would be having dominion like the loving God, the just God of the universe would have that dominion. And so therefore, when we start to ask questions of what we're able to do, that doesn't mean just because we're able to do it, that doesn't imply that we then therefore can or ought to do it. Rather, we want to take our abilities and keep them under the lordship of Christ. And that's really where these questions of ethics, sexuality, really all of them come together under what does it mean to actually live in accord with the way God designed the universe. Now, ultimately, I won't develop this point a whole lot further, but let me just kind of make a particular note of how Francis Schaeffer helped us with this conversation. In his book, uh, Pollution and the Death of Man, he highlights particularly the role of human beings as having a mediatorial role between, uh, the, between God and the rest of creation. And you can see the way I've used the colors to try to identify this, where human beings have a very particular role in that they're like God, having the immaterial part of themselves, being soulish beings who bear his image. And so in that sense, they're acting as ambassadors of God unto the rest of the creation. But because God embedded human beings within the creation, they also have a solidarity, if you will, with the rest of the creation. So even when you talk about environmental ethics or creation care, you have to keep in mind that creation care includes caring for the human being, right? And so the human is given this special role. Not only are they sent from God to be his representative to the rest of the creation, but they're also supposed to bring back from the creation all the glory that God's do. And so you see this beautiful pattern of things flowing out from God by his mercies. And human beings have a special role, if you will, as worship leaders to gather from the, all of the creation to bring back God all the glory that he's due. So with that in mind, then, you could say then, human beings have a particular purpose on the planet in addition to their design and function. And that purpose is to be what, in essence, would be a worship leader. Let me give you some scriptural reference for this. And again, you can ask questions because this is going to go very fast on this particular slide. If you read Genesis 2.15, you'll find that in the English it reads, then the Lord God took the man and he put him in the garden to cultivate it and to keep it. And if you do the word study in regard to the Hebrew here, sorry, my, some of my uh, Hebrew didn't show up on the PowerPoint presentation, didn't translate well here. But the words in Hebrew for cultivate are abad and for um, keep is shamar. And if you do a word study, particularly here's some examples of where you can see this in the text. When these two words show up in the text together in the Hebrew, they're known as a collocation, which is similar to saying something like two peas in a pod. You have the word pea and you have pod, and they have particular meanings, but when you put them together, it means something greater in, in the English language. Well, in Hebrew, when you see these words together, frequently what you'll see is that the words actually refer to the priestly role of keeping God's commandments and worshiping him. So as the Lord places Adam and Eve in the garden with this, with this particular design and this particular function, their purpose in light of a theocentric universe is to return glory to God. So this picture, this mosaic that begins to emerge from Genesis 1 and 2 about the nature of what a human being is, is actually an incredibly beautiful one. Spiritual, physical beings integrated into a whole, designed by God not only to represent him to the created order, but represent the created order back to him and to do so in a manner that they bring worshipful obedience before God so that every part of the universe would glorify him maximally. That's what it means to be a human being in the image of God. What a, what a beautiful picture that God will allow us to have this part. Now, why is this important? Second question. Why is this important that we keep these biblical doctrines in mind? Let me use a couple of visuals to kind of help you see this. As we get to the value of human life, then what this means for us is, is along these lines. A Christian perspective of human value could start to have a visual like this. So if you, if you talk about a, a Euclidean grid and you have value being on this scale and age on this scale, the way we've understood historically human beings is that from the moment of conception to the moment of natural death, we have a high view of the value of human life. But once you begin to introduce other worldviews that don't have a contingency view of us depending on God for our existence, excuse me, and you move more to a naturalistic or atheistic or materialistic worldview, what you're going to introduce now is a new way to think about the value of human beings. 
that at some point you're going to increase in value and you're going to decrease in value and how you mark that will be arbitrary depending on the decision makers. Okay, So here's what's happened over the last 40 or 50 years is that you begin to see particular applications shaping this. Now this is a bit complicated but just follow the same idea. The idea of conception and natural death being where human value is, now you're beginning to see, well, as the abortion and euthanasia debate came up, really the value of human beings became shrunken. And in these marginal spots, well, maybe we can do what we want to with a human being, right? Well, how do you justify that? Because you have a human being all the way through this arc. New language was introduced to suggest that there could be a distinction between being a human being and a human person. How do you make that distinction? Well, we as Christians would say, if you have the Imago Dei, you're a human person. But if you don't have that assumption, then perhaps some other basis has to be developed. And so what people then began to say is, how much do you contribute to society? How well can you function? How well are you developed as a human be being? And that's how you might make a distinction between a human being and a human person. Similarly, as time goes on then, what happens is, is not only do we see it shrinking in regard to conception and natural death, but, and you see birth and old age, but now you're seeing it move to maybe two years after birth or as you then become unwanted in society. So this, the shape of how we understand human personhood is vastly shaping the laws that are taking place all around you, New York uh, has recently had, uh, introduced this exact kind of discussion that's taking place. We saw with the Terry Schiavo case, questions about somebody who is partially conscious and yet is able to have her life taken from her under her husband's decision on the same decision process that took place with Roe v. Wade. Okay, well, as you can see, the questions about what it means to be a human being versus a human person are at the center of the debate, as Dr. Little has introduced for us tonight on that. One more application that I want you to see, if we follow the same logic and human persons are defined upon their function or their ability and their development, well, you've really kind of lost the definition of what it means to be a human person from a theological point of view. If you remove the Imago Dei, then maybe there are other things or other entities that can be persons that are not human beings. For example, maybe a dolphin or perhaps a chimpanzee or perhaps artificial intelligence. And if you watch Star Trek, you might see someone like Data, right? Does that someone have personhood? Well, those questions are the logical implications of what happens when you remove the essential nature of what it means to be a human being. So let me bring conclusion. I know my time's running short here. So let me just bring conclusions by, by saying a few quick things. First of all, I would make the argument for you to consider that there's no such thing as a living human who's not also a person. Okay, so whatever you evaluated in the beginning as I showed you those slides, maybe you have some theological firepower to now answer some of that question a little differently. And I would make the suggestion that both of these have value because the value is based not on what they do or how much they've developed, but on the value God gave to them through the Imago Dei. That might be one application to that. The second one, as we think about what it means to flourish as a human being, one of the best ways to do ethics is to start with an understanding of creation order and what God designed for us, recognizing that much of the questions of humanness are now taking place because people are sinners and we shouldn't be surprised by these things. But as we live through a Christian worldview and we're saved by the grace of God and redemption, part of the restoration is that we would understand and begin to see our world again clearly, not only as God designed it, but Christianly to then understand that we're supposed to be people who take our ethic and help shape the culture around us. And in a day and age when that culture is degrading, that we'd have the moral courage to stand on some of the issues when they go uh, sideways. Well, good evening. It's good to be with everyone here. Uh, this is my first time to Southeastern Seminary, so I'm uh, very pleased to be here. And uh, tonight I want to talk about uh, the transgender movement's abolition of man. Uh, I have two main goals, and uh, to highlight the threat that transgender ideology poses to human identity. And then secondly, I want us to understand the Bible's account of male and female and how that uh, relates to created reality as we know it. So tonight's lecture has uh, as much to do with hermeneutics 
uh, and a philosophy of reality and scripture as much as it does to do with, with transgenderism. So in the ensuing aftermath of the announcement that the Trump administration was drafting a memo to define sex and gender on biological grounds, the New York Times published an article titled, Anatomy Does Not Determine Gender, Experts Say. In the article, uh, the Times science journalist extensively quotes from only one source, uh, Dr. Joshua Safer, who is an endocrinologist and executive director of the Center for Transgender Medicine and Surgery in New York, and he's also the president of the United States Professional Association of Transgender Health. Uh, This is the only source that was quoted in this article, uh, and it's hardly an objective source. But in, in the article, readers are told that defining one's sex based on biology is, to quote, oversimplified and often medically meaningless. But when asked about what determines gender identity, how we construe ourselves as male or female, Safer is left only speculating. He has no answer. Uh, it's, it's biological in some capacity, he grants, uh, but he cannot say for sure, and he admits this in the New York Times. Uh, he goes on to say that all that's left to define one's gender identity is this language, this, a, a, power, a person's powerful core knowledge of who they are which sounds very, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a comment very much in accord with the spirit of the age, kind of uh, Justice Kennedy's Sweet Mystery of Life passage from Casey v, Casey, uh, v. Planned Parenthood in 1992, but it's this notion of, of you construct your identity as an autonomous agent, independent of any uh, uh, thing outside of yourself. But it's worth noting that the ambiguity of Dr. Safer's argument is only exceeded by the disagreement amongst transgender voices themselves on whether any biological component uh, is necessary at all. If you go and actually read transgender theorists and and academics, they disagree on whether you need biology or whether you just rely uh, on on pure uh, self-description when it comes to deciding whether one is male or female. So what's the conclusion that one draws from this article, and and this is, uh, I think, the most important thing to draw from it, is that one of the world's foremost experts confidently dismisses the truth that sex and gender identity are genetic or embodied realities, while at the same time admitting that no one knows for sure uh, how to constitute that definition of male or female. Uh, This is a shocking admission. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't come across that way in the article, uh, but it is, uh, it's, it's purely shocking. The New York Times is platforming a perspective that denies any particular definition uh, of what it means to be male or female, there's, that there's no innate or fixed identity. And so this fact is omitted, that in, in, in the sense of raising male and female to the ground, Dr. Safer is unable to build any edifice on top of that. And this lack of stable definition for what it means to be male and female highlights, I think, the most problematic implication of the transgender movement is that we actually end up abolishing humanity, where we're back to what C.S. Lewis talks about in the abolition of man, that we have uh, an inability to define who we are uh, by virtue of uh, raising objective fixed categories of male and female to the ground. All we're left then uh, for determining what constitutes male and female uh, is what UCLA sociologist Rogers Brubaker, he he says this, is uh, we define ourselves according to the asserted objectivity of subjective identity. So let me say that again, the asserted objectivity of subjective identity. Um, that's, That's academic gobbledygook for basically saying, pick and choose as you go. Uh, and what this ends up doing, it's, it's a radical subjectivity. Uh, it's relativistic, it's incoherent, um, but it makes the human account of who we are as male or female just endlessly revisionist. So how does this revisionist account of humanity uh, and incoherence actually manifest itself uh, in the transgender worldview? And I have about five quick examples Uh, Because the transgender movement, once you work its conclusions to their logical end, it leads down to uh, levels of absurdity. 
Uh, And there's conflicts uh, demonstrating both irrationality of the transgender worldview or ideology and the fact that the LGB movement is in direct uh, conflict with the T of the movement uh, that I'll explain here a little bit later. But one particular example of the conflict inherent within the the transgender world uh, worldview is to consider the women's march. Many of us are familiar with this now, this march that now happens in DC in January. And controversy arose when transgender activists claimed they were discriminated against because the march's infamous symbol, and I'm not going to repeat what the name of the hat is, but we all know the typical hat that's worn at the women's march, uh, that that hat uh, was discriminatory to transgender uh women who are biological males because that hat reduces womanhood to a biological marker such as one's genitalia. So there's, there's, there's internal conflict and tension. Uh, because, as we're told in the age that we now live in, uh, some men have uteruses and some men do not. Uh, this is common language that we're being told to uh, accept and adopt. Secondly is I want us to consider the rise of what's called the TERFS, T-E-R-F-S. That stands for Trans Exclusionary Radical Feminists. And this is a group uh, who claim that transgenderism erases women. Uh, this, is, uh, of, this is because uh, feminism presupposes that an authentic, objective womanhood actually exists. Uh, And it's hard to posit any meaningful idea of feminism when feminism is emptied of any innate feminine trait. So the transgender movement cannot countenance such an idea as feminism because it views gender as nothing more than a disembodied social construct and a product of psychological identity. Third quick example is this issue concerning athletics. Uh, In the name of equality and fairness, Uh, Transgender ideology promotes inequality and unfairness by allowing biological males uh, with their native strength to compete against biological females. Uh, And we have documented instances across the United States where you have biological males competing as females and winning state track and field championships uh, against, against women. Uh, the Boston Marathon, for the, la- for the first time ever in 2018, allowed biological males to compete as women. So again, our society espouses equality and fairness, uh, but then undermines those things uh, with tran- transgender ideology. Fourth is to, uh, concerning the protection of women and children. And I say this especially in light of the recent reintroduction of the Equality Act, uh, which in the words of one Wall Street Journal editorial, editorialist means that any biological male who self-identifies as male would, under the Equality Act, be legally entitled to enter women's restrooms, locker rooms, and protective facilities such as battered women's shelters. Uh, this would put women and girls at immediate physical risk. Uh, As Kara Dansky, she's the media director of the Women's Liberation Front, hardly a bastion of Christian conservatism, Uh, she said this regarding the implications of the Equality Act, that it would eliminate women and girls as a coherent legal category worthy of civil rights protection. And it would do so by redefining the category of woman to include women and those who say they are women, which means women and people who aren't women at all according to her own words. And then lastly is this this conflict of the LGB movement and the T side of the movement that demonstrates how progressive sexual and gender ethics are at odds. Uh, Many of us in this room might be familiar with Andrew Sullivan, who's a prolific writer, uh, himself a gay man. He wrote a stunningly intellectually honest piece in The New Yorker uh, last month discussing how transgender ideology actually erases uh, a stable concept of homosexuality. He writes that the core, of the, very, uh, the core of the traditional gay claim is that there is indeed a very big difference between male and female, that the difference matters, and without it, homosexuality would make no sense at all. He further states this. He goes, 
If you abandon biology in the matter of sex and gender altogether, you may help trans people live fuller, less conflicted lives, but you also undermine the very meaning of homosexuality. If you follow the current ideology of gender as entirely fluid, you actually subvert and undermine core arguments in defense of gay rights. Contemporary transgender ideology is not a complement to gay rights. In some ways, it is the active opposition to them. Because homosexuality implies and demands a static definition of male and female. If male and female is just a matter of psychological self-description, uh, a construct of homosexuality collapses, which upsets uh, Andrew Sullivan, himself not a conservative. Uh, more could be said about all of the uh, categories where the transgender ideology impacts the culture uh, and how it, quite frankly, I, I think erases uh, w womanhood from our culture. Uh, but in the interest of time, I want to refocus our conversation to this question. Is there an alternative view for grounding male and female identity? And I would say yes, there certainly is, and it's one built upon the Bible, but it requires an understanding on the relationship between general and special revelation. So we believe, as the Bible, is a Christian document, right? Shocking, we're at seminary. The Bible is a Christian document. Um, but it is also foundationally uh, a creational document. Uh, as one European ethicist wrote, the Christian doctrine of creation is precisely such a way of explaining why there are aspects of reality that are invested with normative moral significance. So that the Bible is actually giving a, a true portrait and description of reality as it is, that the Bible is not just a collection of, of um, fideistic uh, decrees, that it actually inheres within creation. What this scholar means is that the Bible is not strictly sectarian. Uh, we have to consider where within the storyline of scripture that scripture is speaking on a given topic. This is why a definition of marriage has uh, different application in the storyline of scripture than our definition of baptism. Uh, marriage is an institution of creation. Baptism is one of redemption. And when we look at what it means to be male and female in Genesis 1, script, scripture is speaking of created reality. It's not speaking of a segmented, cordoned off, epistemologically uh, sectarian, Christian uh, view of of. Reality. Ultimately, it is a Christian view of reality, but what we're trying to say here is that it is an accurate view of reality as it truly is. That creation does not require an exclusively Christian epistemology for its authority or intelligibility. But of course, as we learn from Genesis 3, uh, sin warps human perception and cognition and our epistemology. So we all know that creation does require explanation in line with the full drama of Christian doctrine. But my argument is that the Genesis account of humanity's creation provides a substantive and coherent and quite frankly stable account for defining male and female identity because it comports with what is true of human nature and human design as we know it, uh, as secular science knows it, or once knew it before it became, I think, heavily more politicized uh, in, in light of where we are today. Uh, and it does this chiefly because the Bible speaks of the male-female binary on both special revelation and general revelation grounds simultaneously. That male and female are attested to in Scripture, Genesis 1, Genesis 2, and they're experienced in creation. That uh, male and female in scripture and in reality, according to the Christian worldview, are not in tension with one another. The special revelation male-female uh, male binary in scripture possesses the same teleology or purpose of the male-female binary, a general revelation and natural law. This identical teleology reflects, I think, the splendor of Scripture's authority. Uh, it, it gives an authoritative view of created reality, but does so in an inscripturated form, in, in written form. Uh, in the same way that natural law is a product of divine law, I believe it's correct to say that general revelation stands on its own, and special revelation stands behind it for its deepest explanation. 
So I want to establish two presuppositions to this question of male and female identity. First, from Genesis 1, 26 through 28, the Bible affirms the truth of an objective, enduring male-female binary. And second, the presence of this gender binary is made on creational and teleological grounds, meaning that it's not based on pragmatism, coincidence, uh, emotivism, or just pure sentimentality. That it, it's, it's there, it exists. So the, the teleology of male-female special revelation uh, has three component parts. And these three component parts are what I refer to as kind of the Genesis blueprint for defining what it means to be male and female that, again, is inscripturated as special revelation, but also, again, corresponds to reality as it is. And the first uh, core component of this uh, special revelation binary is simply this. God made humanity in his image, which is what Dr. Dr. Leder, uh, Lederbach just discussed. And this is the source of our dignity. Uh, that the image of God has relational, structural, and functional implications that follow from it. That second, God designed humanity in the form of male and female counterparts. Uh, this binary is sexually unitive and complementary. Uh, it's objective. It's universal. Uh, it's ultimately intelligible and differentiated. That God made us distinct uh, down to the level of our chromosomes. And then third, God designed male and female for one another in a complementary, exclusive, and permanent relationship. So again, this is the kind of the, the Genesis blueprint. God made humanity in his image. He made humanity male and female, and male and female are made for one another. I think those three principles explain kind of the architecture of uh, theological anthropology as it relates to the sexes and the, the unity of the sexes. So the question then becomes is how as Christians should we understand creationally and biblically what it means to be made male and female according to the Bible? So I, I want to talk about the creational aspects more. It means that the binary present in special revelation, uh, the Bible, is identical to the uh, to the general revelation binary of nature. That uh, nature and Bible are not in conflict when it comes to male and female. We're uh, entering into questions of natural law, and I think uh, this is a branch of ethics Protestants need to expose themselves uh, more, uh, more to if we're going to have sophisticated conversations when it comes to marriage uh, and, and gender that natural law ethics helps explain the unity of both special and general revelation. Uh, a good friend of mine who's a natural law scholar, Ryan Anderson of the Heritage Foundation, he talks about this in terms of how we define male and female. He says this, he says, sex in terms of male or female is identified by the organization of the organism for sexually reproductive acts. Sex as a status, male or female, is a recognition of the organization of a body that has the ability to engage in sex as an act. And Anderson's use of organization in terms of what our body is overall organized for and what its capacity has is crucial to establishing a stable definition of male and female. Uh, Robert George, a scholar at Princeton, he said this. He said, sex is constituted and sex being male or female, is constituted by our basic biological organization, organization with respect to reproductive functioning. It is an inherent part of what and who we are. Um, Anderson's research that I quoted from draws from an extensive report by two Johns Hopkins scholars, Paul McHugh and Lawrence Meyer, who looked at the field of scholarly research around sexual orientation and gender identity and argued that their findings suggested that the academic literature, which argues that gender identity is distinct from biological sex, does not provide actually sufficient evidence to verify that claim when you look at the field's studies in the aggregate. And these two scholars offered a response uh, offering a, a definition of male-female identity 
uh, that provides a more stable conceptual basis. And, and they write this. They say that the underlying basis of maleness and femaleness is the distinction between the reproductive roles of the sexes. In mammals, such as humans, the female gestates offspring and the male impregnates the female. More universally, the male of the species fertilizes the egg cells provided by the female of the species. This conceptual basis for sex roles is binary and stable and allows us to distinguish males from females on the grounds of their reproductive systems, even when these individual, individuals exhibit behaviors that are not typicals of males and females. And that last line is really, really crucial because he's saying we don't define male and female simply by stereotype or by behavior. You define it by function and design. They go on later, uh, it is writing, it is these reproductive roles that provide the conceptual basis for the differentiation of animals and the biological categories of male and female. And then on a solemn note, they say this, there is no other widely accepted biological classification for the sexes. So we're, prevent, we're, we're presenting right now a lot of kind of natural law, biological description of what it means to be male and female. The question, and I'm going to get to this, is, is what does the Bible have to say in terms of this uh, design argument? Does, does the Genesis 1 and 2 language line up? Uh, does the special revelation line up with what we know in creation, what, what science is able to tell, to tell us. And I want to argue that the above definitions uh, that we heard from McHugh and, and uh, Lawrence and Anderson parallel with the creation account of man and woman revealed in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Notice in those passages that the creation of man and woman is both structural and dynamic. That we are designed, made male and female, but towards a particular end, which is to exercise dominion, be fruitful, rule on God's behalf. As male and female beings made in God's image, their design is ordered towards a particular purpose, filling the earth, subduing it, exercising dominion. And more specifically, that purpose is accomplished how? How do we exercise dominion and multiply and be fruitful? That's done and hinges on the respective sex distinction and difference between males and females. So, so notice what we know from biological science and what we can see from special revelation, they're providing parallel accounts of how we define male and female in a way that's actually stable, uh, that doesn't, that's not irrational. So the biblical narrative around Genesis 1 and 2 explains categorically, thematically, and observationally what biology confirms to us as reality. That maleness and femaleness are biological realities ordered by their reproductive organization. Again, it's not, that, it's not just that God made us male and female. What does he say when he makes us male and female? Be fruitful and multiply, which presupposes what? A design and a capacity. So while scholars distinguish special revelation from general revelation, the creation account of man and woman demonstrate one area where, where general and, and uh, special revelation, they speak with one voice. So this means that a, a biblical view of what defines a man and woman must be defined according to God's design. So God created us male and female, but he made us male and female in creation. And so creation, as we know it, bears witness to God's uh, authority and lordship and creation over reality. And here's my definition of what a man or a woman is. That a man and woman are an image bearer of God whose biological design is oriented to fulfill a creational mandate of subduing creation by his and her covenantal marriage union with their sexual counterpart. So it doesn't mean, this doesn't mean that you're only fully male or female if you get married and have kids, okay? Please hear me say that. What I'm saying is, by virtue of how you are designed, every single person in here, regardless of whether you get married, possesses a design intrinsically ordered uh, to a particular end. I'm going to begin my conclusion here. 
Uh, Francis Fukuyama, who is not a Christian, uh, but is a, a very wise political philosopher, argues that the endless quest for subjective identity over time um, fractures society's collective need for stability. Uh, one of the greatest dangers to the, the transgender movement is it, it destabilizes the script that a society has to have if it hopes to be a functioning, governable, political society. We have to know who we are as people existing in society if we hope to organize society at all. I mean, and, and you might even argue that a failure to classify ourselves accurately is scraping at the bottom of the barrel in terms of us uh, going haywire as a society. If we can't get this right, uh, it, it, it bodes very poorly for uh, human flourishing on a social level. But Francis Fukuyama says this, he says, human beings are intensely social creatures whose emotional inclinations drive them to want to conform to the norms surrounding them. When a stable, shared moral horizon disappears and is replaced by a cacophony of competing value systems, the vast majority of people do not rejoice at their newfound freedom of choice. Rather, they feel an intense insecurity and alienation because they, uh, because they do not know who their true self is. And this is why we're having, um, I get emails and phone calls from public school teachers who find themselves in positions of being unable to tell children whether they are a male or a female or a boy or a girl because of laws facing their particular municipality. So in, in the name of tolerance and social justice, we're actually destabilizing society. So the Christian response to such a reality means that Christian ethics has the responsibility to explain creation and nature to a world whose fallen natures refuse to believe the truth about itself and themselves and who fail to properly interpret the world's design in the fullness of God's revelation. So I think one, a, a, an aspect of neighbor love right now for us as Christians is to confidently and proudly claim the male-female binary because it comports with, at the level of conscience, most people know this to be true, uh, but there's a social contagion and a social pathology that makes state, stating something like that politically incorrect, uh, which then poses harms on the, the vulnerable and the impressionable uh, in our society. So Christian ethics is a truth-telling act uh, because we want to tell society and government that they should not play fast and loose with its most, most basic constituency, which is people. Uh, that humanity is not elastic, that law ought to reflect the truth about human nature and not capitulate to what uh, Oliver O'Donovan refers to as psychological positivists, those who would create reality based on psychological perception alone. Uh, it's very interesting, there was a, uh, N.T. Wright, the renowned scholar, um, not known as a uh, flaming culture warrior, wrote an editorial in the London Times uh, responding to concerns about the transgender movement over in the UK. And I, I want to remind you again, N.T. Wright uh, is, not, is not, not someone who is lobbing bombs on social issues. Uh, he wrote this actually. He said, the confusion about gender identity is a modern and now internet-fueled form of the ancient philosophy of Gnosticism. The Gnostic, one who knows, has discovered the secret of who I really am behind the deceptive outward appearance uh, of the body. This involves denying the goodness or even the ultimate reality of the natural world. Now notice what he ends. He says, nature, however, tends to strike back with the likely victims in this case being vulnerable and impressionable youngsters who, as confused adults, will pay the price for their elders' fashionable fantasies. Would you do me a favor? Would you stand just a second? And let me just say how grateful I am while you're standing. Let me just say how grateful I am 
uh, to be here. I've been I've been on this campus several times, uh, but I've never been in this room before. And this this is a special room for me now that I know uh, about its uh, 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 origins and the memory that it holds, uh, because. Um, Russ Bush was one of my professors at Southwestern Seminary, in whose class, Introduction to Christian Philosophy, we watched the Francis Schaeffer, How Shall We Then Live, video series. And Dr. Bush didn't show videos very much. It had to be something sub substantive. And also know, um, as much as I uh, knew uh, Dr. Bush, uh, I also know that he would appreciate the fact, as a lecturer, that the clock has no hands on it. Um, but alas, my, my uh, uh, smartphone does, so please be seated. Thank you. So thank you for um, helping us frame the issue, Dr. Lederbach. Uh, and uh, Dr. Lederbach reminded us that our meta-ethics will inform how we think about some of these practical and applied issues. Uh, our essential nature as image bearers of the living God, our enduring qualities, male and female, um, are important for understanding where we're going next because what I want to do in the next few minutes uh, and then perhaps in our Q&A, is to test our valuation of uh, the image bearers. And I want to do that in the context of uh, a technology that you have probably heard about and that I will try to explain to you in lay terms. I'm not a scientist, so it will have to be lay terms, but uh, a technology that um, has the potential to revolutionize molecular genetic therapies and treatments in ways that uh, pose both, both uh, formidable uh, benefits uh, to human um, uh, flourishing, but also um, formidable risks. Uh, November 26, 2018, uh, the world was shocked by a bombshell announce announcement that He Jiangui, or Kwai, uh, claimed to have edited the genomes, the genetic blueprint of twin girls in China. Uh, this was a supreme irony in one sense because this was at the second international summit on human geno genome editing, uh, a summit at which the, the, um, uh, the, those who, f who put the summit together were hoping to assure the world that nothing could possibly go wrong with gene editing because everyone had it under control. Uh, in fact, um, Dr. He was uh, actually uh, doing experiments sort of off the radar that no one knew. What was he doing? Well, he uh, enlisted seven uh, consenting parents, couples, uh, and uh, uh, the, he retrieved sperm from one HIV-positive father, an egg from an HIV-negative mother, and through in vitro fertilization, uh, he generated a number of embryos. And he used this technology that I'll explain a little bit more about in just a few moments called CRISPR uh, to modify the genome, to modify or edit the genetic blueprint uh, in order to make those uh, offspring uh, resistant to HIV, a putatively good um, uh, uh, outcome. Uh, he used 31 embryos, uh, 20 he claims were successfully modified, and two, the twins, uh, were implanted and brought to term. Uh, he claimed no off-target modifications, that is, that, that everything went according to plan, uh, uh, but uh, presumably uh, 29 embryos died in the process, bringing to the foreground the question that that Dr. Lederbach posed for us at the beginning, what is the nature of the unborn human being? Uh, what is the nature of the human person? Two girls were born, both apparently healthy, um, uh, um, and there was an announcement uh, made at this conference, but no publication yet, no, no um, documentary evidence to support the claim. I, 
I spoke uh, in January with a friend of mine who, who happens to know Dr. He, and uh, he believes that, in fact, uh, these two uh, offspring, these two girls do exist, and that Dr. Dr. He was able to accomplish what he claims to have accomplished, though the scientific world is still waiting for those data. Well, that puts this in the context of genetic augmentation or genetic manip manipulation. And, and it, it, the reality is that we've been manipulating genes for a long time. Here's a, an instance in uh, the Bible, in Genesis chapter 30, of a kind of selective breeding. Um, uh, Dr. Little uh, tells me he's, a, he's just a farmer. Uh, and so farmers know about genetic manipulation. Uh, we... Um, uh, uh, we know that most of the, the animals that we eat uh, in our food supply uh, have been genetically uh, manipulated through selective breeding in one way or another, some in other ways, but uh, some through selective breeding. Uh, we know that uh, Gregor Mendel, uh, a monk, uh, actually helped us understand, as he came to understand the nature of uh, genetic inheritance in his experiment with pea plants. Uh, Mid-20th century, Watson and Crick uh, dis uh, discovered or deduced the double helical nature of the DNA molecule, that, that twisted ladder that we see all of the time when, we're, when we see the symbol for uh, genetics. Uh, in the 1970s, there was a major controversy over uh, the, the, the uh, uh, application of so-called recombinant DNA technology. This was, this was uh, uh, the ability to augment bacteria, uh, and, and there were worries uh, about uh, what if a particular bacterium that has been modified now escapes and uh, creates all kinds of... Um, uh, problems for our, our, our culture, for our uh, biology. Uh, there are certainly the benefits that come through recombinant DNA uh, technology. Uh, human insulin is one of those. Uh, others include um, uh, treatments for breast cancer, for instance, that are a result of our understanding of, of recombinant DNA. Uh, but but and vaccines, but but there are also great concerns. And in the mid 1970s, uh, there was a famous conference at Asilomar, um, uh, where scientists worried about this um, uh, this problem of uh, random bacterial mutation and what it could mean for devastating um, human food supply uh, and and other things. Um, uh, in 1989, uh, there was a uh, we, we discovered the ability to uh, modify the germline. So, so let me explain. Let me explain germline this way. We have two kinds of cells in our bodies. We have somatic cells. These are cells like our skin. Skin cells reproduce skin cells, um, uh, and we also have. Um, uh, germline cells or germ cells, our reproductive cells, sperm and egg. Uh, modifications made to the somatic cell are, are modifications that stay within that particular individual, whether it's an animal, a plant, or a human being. So if you modified my skin cells, uh, I would be the only one affected by it. Uh, if you modify my reproductive cells, my germ cell, my sperm cells, and I have offspring, then those modifications are passed on from one generation to another. So in 1989, um, uh, uh, scientists were able to modify the germ cells of a so-called knockout mouse. And this was uh, a mouse that was designed to... Um, uh, uh, so that it did not express a certain uh, protein uh, and uh, could be used then for research. So you want, to, you want to suppress the protein so you can see what the effect is going to be over time, not just in that mouse, but in all of the mouse's offspring. And so on the right down here, you have the leptin knockout mouse uh, as a model for studying type 2 diabetes, and the, the knockout mouse is the obese mouse. Uh, so it has a certain genetic uh, uh, condition that has been caused uh, by manipulations in the lab that make it uh, behave uh, 
um, uh, as, well, not behave as, but it, it is a diabetic um, mouse. Uh, the problem with, with this particular technology is that it's very expensive and takes months and months to uh, develop to the experimental phase. So $10,000 and 10 months to be able to get the, the knockout mouse that you want for uh, experimentation. And it's not, it's not um, uh, possible in all species. Uh, I'm going to skip this slide just for time's sake. Um, uh, and and um, again, uh, we can also um, now alter the genome of an individual, the somatic cell versus the germ cell. When you do somatic cell gene therapy, uh, you uh, replace or augment a specific uh, gene for that particular individual. Uh, this works best for certain kinds of diseases. And the important feature here is that it's not inheritable. It's not, not something that you pass from one generation to another. So why, was, uh, why is CRISPR such a big deal? Um, why, is, why was this announcement met with such... Um, concern. Uh, well, let's, let's talk a little bit about what CRISPR is. Uh, first of all, it is the, the acronym stands for Clustered Regularly Interspaced Short Palindromic Repeats. And now you know. Uh, of course, it's clear. Uh, es essentially, CRISPR is uh, the augmentation of a, a gene um, in such a way uh, that the, the DNA sequence is altered, you clip it, if you will, and it stitches itself back together in a certain way. So you, you want to remove a certain segment of the genome, you, you clip it, you snip it out, and then using recombinant DNA um, uh, technology, uh, that, that strand is stitched back in with a different uh, code, a different um, a different combination, like a combination lock. And so um, it is simpler and faster than the older method. So instead of 10 months for a knockout mouse, in two months you get a knock, knockout mouse. Um, it, it can multitask, so you can do more uh, than one gene at a time. It works in almost any cell and species, and it could potentially alter entire populations in the wild as, as these populations breed over time with this um, uh, augmented um, genome. Um, it, it could have wonderful applications in um, humans in individual or somatic uh, uh, alterations. It could make gene therapy more feasible, uh, more effective, more efficacious, uh, could be used to address some dominant diseases, uh, and that's one of the things you'll always hear, or look at the ways this could be used to give healing, um, and uh, uh, nevertheless share some limitations with older methods. In the germ line, um, in the, the inheritable uh, line, sperm and egg, uh, genes could be easily altered in early embryos, more about that in just a second, um, and multiple genes could be altered all at once, and all descendants would uh, presumably inherit um, those changes. There are some technical problems I just want to highlight. Uh, one is uh, so-called off-target effects, genes other than those that are intended could be altered. It's more com our 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 uh, biology is more complex sometimes than our technology, right? Um, uh, some cells in the embryo may be modified, others not. Uh, 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 the term for that is mosaicism, uh, but but it just means that again we're not accomplishing the end or the goal that we hope to accomplish. Uh, and the target gene may be inactivated rather than modified. You could turn off a gene that you want just to be just to be modified. I'll say I'll say something else about that in a second. So, here are some ethical issues that I want to highlight as we think about uh, um, the application of CRISPR to human subjects, and specifically as we talk about Dr. Hu's um, research. Um, first of all. The, uh, the public is, is uh, divided over whether or not to use gene editing technology, especially for um, uh, uh, heritable conditions. Uh, if you poll uh, the culture, if you poll the society, this is uh, Pew 
uh, polls, if you poll our, our citizenry, uh, people are, um, tend to be uh, somewhat worried about the, the potentials. Uh, and, uh, and I think that's partly because people don't understand. But I also think uh, that they understand just enough uh, to be worried about the, either the misapplication or uh, a, a technology that kind of runs uh, afoul of its design. When Dr. Hu made his announcement, uh, there was general shock and condemnation. Uh, I'm told that the first response of the Chinese government was one of elation. Uh, China had done it first again. Uh, but as soon as the public outcry began to arise internationally, um, things changed. And I'll show you what China has done more recently. Um, but the shock and condemnation was not about modifying those embryos in the first place, um, uh, but it was about the violation of a voluntary moratorium on implanting those embryos. So it wasn't that, it wasn't that the embryos had been modified themselves, but that they had been transferred to the woman's um, body. It was, also, it was also against the canons of contemporary science uh, to, to do this in secret and not have uh, the peer review or ethical oversight of the research. Um, and so many of the Chinese scientists uh, were dismayed that Dr. He had, um, uh, had, had, had um, done this in secret uh, without proper ethical oversight. Few people supported it, uh, George Church, um, uh, at Harvard, um, uh, writes on uh, so-called regenerative medicine, among other things. Um, I think I can say this without fear of reprisal. Um, Dr. Church hasn't met a technology he didn't like, and so he, he is enthusiastic about nearly every, nearly every new uh, uh, technology and every new development. Um, and many uh, in the scientific community feared that a backlash uh, uh, of, um, against uh, what Dr. Hu had done uh, would uh, slow the science and also give science a bad name. Uh, Dr. H Dr. Hu, I believe, uh, thought that, that this announcement would, would maybe result in his receiving a Nobel Prize, and now he's labeled a scientific rogue. Um, it's, a, it's a very sad um, reality in some ways. Um, uh, Dr. Francis Collins, the director uh, of the National Institutes of Health in the United States, uh, puts it this way, the work of Dr. Uh, he presented at Gene Edit Summit is profoundly disturbing, disturbing and tramples on ethical norms. We need to develop binding international consensus on limits for this research. NIH does not support the use of gene editing in human embryos. Um, others, um, uh, including his own colleagues, um, um, blasted uh, uh, Dr. He for his announcement. Uh, 122 Chinese scientists issued a passionate public statement that they firmly oppose uh, and strongly condemn uh, what he has done. And within a few days, more than 300 other scientists um, set out to confront the issue through a document that you can find online, 10 questions uh, posed to Dr. Uh, uh, John Kwai. Um, uh, that the, the, the controversy wasn't just in China. Uh, you, may, you may recall that there were American scientists who were uh, complicit in uh, and knew about what he was doing. And uh, one researcher at Rice University is still under investigation by his uh, university for his involvement in or p potential complicity in uh, Dr. He's, um research. So, so what were some of the problems? Well, first of all, the, the, the embryos and therefore the children that were uh, born uh, from this uh, CRISPR technology were subjected to unnecessary risks. Anthony Fauci, uh, who heads the National Institute for Allergy and Infectious Disease, says, look, there are much better treatments for HIV than genetic modification." It's, it's sort of like drinking water out of a fire hydrant. It's, it's an overreach. There's no reason to do this 
uh, for HIV resistance. Um, uh, secondly, um, if, if uh, like me, uh, you think embryos are persons, uh, then it's not inconsequential uh, that 29 embryos died in the attempts to um, get two successful babies to term. Uh, and that's, that's a problem, uh, generally speaking, with in vitro fertilization, uh, but in, in this case, in vitro fertilization following CRISPR or following the genetic editing. Uh, there's also the problem of unintended consequences for future generations. Imagine this scenario. Imagine that in an effort to do, to do good, um, scientists who are using CRISPR edit a gene that turns out to be um, uh, fatal over time. Not, not immediately fatal, but, but maybe uh, in 30 years. When, when the patient is 30 years old or the person is 30 years old, they get a fatal disease. And those, um, those, those uh, uh, human beings are allowed and, and would presumably uh, procreate. Um, then you have a whole... A generation or a whole clan, perhaps, of uh, human beings who have this fatal genetic anomaly that has been created, maybe unintentionally, but been created by people um, uh, in in the lab. What do you do? I mean, what what kind of um, what kind of consideration should they receive um, in terms of in terms of insurance? Or life insurance, or, or another question is if you if you identified uh, them as having this genetic anomaly that was going to cause fatalities in the future in future offspring, how would you keep them from procreating? Uh, would you t would you would you fine them? Would you sterilize them? Would you incarcerate them? None of those sound like good options. Um, so the problem of unintended consequences for future generations is not an insignificant um, problem. Um, I think that, that CRISPR in, applied to heritable uh, modifications, applied to um, uh, future modifications of our, of our um, uh, um, germline, lead us to think that we might use this technology to make human beings better, smarter, faster, um, um, more compassionate, uh, so-called genetic enhancement. And, and, and genetic enhancement um, asks us to think in eugenic terms. Think about how we can create a better race, uh, a race that has fewer diseases, a race that has uh, better qualities. And so, and, and we've been there before. I don't have time to rehearse the, the American eugenics movement. I'll just say that that um, uh, the American uh, the, the British and the American eugenics movement was was the uh, fuel for what uh, Hitler later did in his quest for the pure Aryan race after World War II and the atrocities that we saw in World War II. Eugenics became a dirty word and and it went underground and it's now being revived again in a in a, a softer, gentler, shinier. Uh, uh, way now called liberal eugenics. Uh, we could talk about that during uh, the Q and A. Also, there was a problem of consent uh, and possible inducements. According to the consent form that Dr. He used, uh, the, the total value of the treatments and payments to these families was approximately four times the annual wage in urban China. Now, not a lot of money for us, particularly $40,000, but for them, this was a huge inducement to participate in the research. And um, those kinds of coercions uh, are, again, against the, the canons of contemporary um, science. Um, in the aftermath of Dr. Hu's announcement, uh, China has now declared gene editing of infants illegal. Uh, and wants to develop a kind of central authority to um, uh, regulate uh, uh, these uh, developments and, and uh, these technologies. Um, uh, in last week's uh, Nature magazine, an international cadre of scientists and ethicists uh, published um, uh, an article calling for an, a moratorium on heritable genome editing, but not a ban. 
uh, maybe a five-year pause, uh, and let's talk about this more. Um, and uh, for those, again, who worry uh, that, um, uh, that embryos are people too, um, that embryos matter, uh, a pause is not um, good enough, it seems to me. But we can talk more about that in the, in the uh, uh, Q&A. And uh, the World Health Organization uh, last week, or this week actually, um, responded to the call for moratorium and said, no, you know what we really need is just a registry. We don't really need a moratorium. We just need to know better what's going on and let everybody uh, sort of uh, do their own thing. Uh, if you want to know more about, um, about the development of CRISPR, uh, Jennifer Dudna and Samuel Sternberg have written a volume. They're, they were both the pioneers of this technique, uh, A Crack in Creation, Gene Editing and the Unthinkable Power to Control Evolution. If you want a fictional account of where we're going, watch Gattaca again. Uh, it's, a, it's an intriguing uh, exploration of a uh, potential future. And if you want to read the history of the future, um, then read Brave New World, uh, Abolition of Man, and That Hideous Strength. C.S. Lewis said that this was the nonfiction account of what he tried to put in the fictional account, That Hideous Strength. Uh, so read them. Read them. Uh, subsequently, read them one after the other.